Hi, and welcome to Studio 411. You've caught me napping here. There we go. I think we're all set. I'm Larry De Silva. Thank you for joining us. And uh, of course, I say this with every show, but if you look around, we, we literally have a, uh, a, a scene here that is probably only King Tut's tomb would be more <laughs> impressive than this. We have a uh, terrific show ahead for you, and we hope you'll uh, stick around for the hour and joining us. Uh, we have a gentleman here, uh, our, our second Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, but uh, no less uh, uh, well known than, than uh, our prior one, Chris Jasper. Uh, Dennis Dunaway joining us. Of course, Dennis uh, was a, a founding member of the, uh, the Alice Cooper group uh, back in the uh, uh, actually late 60s and a uh, healthy run they enjoyed. And also uh, in 2011, Dennis will not, if I'm wrong on the date, uh, elected into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with the, uh, the band. Uh, something I didn't know was we all think Alice, oh, Alice is just like one person. No, Alice Cooper really was a a group of five gentlemen, and we'll get into that. Uh, and uh, joining um, uh, Dennis here as well is his lovely wife and uh, uh, a costume designer for uh, many years with uh, the band, as well as a few other outfits, such as The Who and a couple of others she'll tell us about. Cindy Smith, uh, Smith Dunaway. And you say, Smith, hmm, why does that name sound familiar? Well, her brother was Neil Smith, of course, drummer for the Alice Cooper group. and. Uh, uh, Dennis's book, uh, along with uh, Chris uh, Hodenfield, Snakes, as my wife, the French teacher, would say, Guillotines, Electric Chairs, My Adventures in the Alice C Cooper Group. And uh, we welcome to Studio 411, Dennis Dunaway and Cindy Smith Dunaway. <sighs> welcome. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having there us. There we go. That's terrific. And uh, again, I feel like we've been transported in time here. Dennis is, uh, and Cindy have brought a... Uh, a terrific uh, ensemble of uh, costumes behind them and some other things. We'll talk about the guitar a little bit later. Uh, tell me, um, I know the idea for the book actually has been in the works for probably uh, close to 20 years. Yeah, pushing 20 years. 1997, Easter is when I decided to write it. And uh, now you and Chris actually went back a few years before that. Actually, he was a reporter for Rolling Stone magazine, correct? Right, for about a dozen years back. Uh, he wrote the cover story of the Alice Cooper group for Rolling Stone in 1972. So he went on the road with us for a while. And uh, there's a great picture that Annie Leibovitz took of us all in a diner. And there's a waitress in the middle and the counter goes around her and Annie snuck in inside the counter and it's the Alice Cooper group all looking like we need a cup of coffee desperately and and Chris is uh, sitting over there reading up on the newspaper so there you go and the digress a moment here's a photo uh, taken only a few days ago of, of the uh, <laughs> lovely couple we have here today and of course uh, there's there's a whole story we'll get into about uh, you and Cindy, again, Cindy's uh, brother, Neil, uh, a drummer with the band. Uh, there's, uh, there's your uh, partner in uh, book crime, Chris. Yep. And uh, so again, that was a, a labor of love. And I hear tell you're basically of the surviving members of the band, even when Glenn was uh, with us, was that you're basically the one that kind of remembers everything. You're. Well, it's amazing what yeah, you remember. You're kind of the contrast to the old joke about if you remember this, then you weren't right. really there. But in his case, <laughs> uh, he manages to incorporate uh, all well, those things. Well, I, I grew up being the artist. In grade school, a lot of kids didn't even know my real name. They called me the artiste. <laughs> and uh, I was just quiet and uh, hard to tell not these days, but I was uh, introverted and an observer. and. So that's one reason I remember more things. The other reason is because I would write everything down. If anybody in the band said something, I would jot it down on a piece of paper, like possibly just to remember something funny or, or clever or thinking, oh, this might be a good idea for a song someday. Yeah. And I'd toss it in the bottom of the suitcase, and then Cindy would go, what do you got all this paper in your suitcase? He actually still does this. <laughs> many many shoe boxes of paper. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> well, then also because Cindy was there throughout the career of the Alice Cooper group, uh, you know, we both have our, our memories to keep, uh, you know, in check with each other. And right? I kept journals the whole time. Wow. 
and my Neil would write me letters from the road, and Dennis would write me, and my mother as well. So Neil yeah. wrote. There's another book in the making. It sounds like to me. I don't know. I think uh, Chris <laughs> yeah. better better do double duty. Just to digress a moment here, we have an early shot, probably taken in a Woolworths, <laughs> but so that we don't confuse the audience. Now that's obviously Vince later Alice Cooper. Now that's you obviously taken in one of those old fashioned photo right, machines. Right, probably at the Christown Mall in uh, Phoenix, yeah. Arizona, Phoenix, right. where we met and, uh, as 16 year olds. You now know, you're originally see. from Oregon, uh, correct? Yeah, I migrated. My family came down from Oregon because my dad was in lumber and the sawmill got pretty dangerous. At a couple of uh, incidences happened. And so we moved to Arizona and uh, Vince, Alice's yeah. family, uh, he was born in Detroit, and they migrated to Arizona. Gotcha. Okay, so that's where the later Detroit connection already had kind of a basis there. Right, and then Cindy and, and her brother Neil migrated from uh, Akron, Ohio, and by coincidence, uh, uh, Glenn Buxton was also from Akron. So, okay. so his we had all kinds of Akron well. stories. Sure, yep. absolutely. Now, how did you get the name Dr. Dreary? And I noticed you, you still use that sometimes. But I do. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, well. Did Alice or Vince rather uh, give you that? Or yes, did, did, yeah. yes. Alice uh, gave me that nickname. And that, that's reflective of my introverted phase where I would be very quiet while everybody else is firing all these sarcastic witticisms back and forth, say, in the station wagon while the band's driving around the country. And. I'd be the quiet guy in the back, and all of a sudden I'd blurt out this uh, pretty abstract uh, joke, which I thought was a joke, but every, everything would come to a screeching halt, and they'd be trying to figure out what that meant. And then Alice uh, would say, uh, I think Dennis is having a heartbeat. So it, <laughs> then, he, then he tagged me with Dr. Dreary as having a heartbeat. <laughs> I know he came from a background where, again, a, a spiritual family was, uh, or someone was a minister, his I think. Right, his or, father yeah, was yeah. part-time minister. Yeah, and stuff. So uh, some of that wisdom or the, the quips that he would come out with, do you kind of attribute that to his upbringing or just kind of just had a uh, knack for coming up with these uh, kind Alice's of ideas? Alice's father was very hip. Uh, he was a minister, but... But he still uh, was up on the British invasion bands. You know, we could, he, he knew trivia about, uh, you know, the kinks and the yardbirds wow. and stuff. So, so he was very hip uh, minister and uh, uh, very uh, uh, congenial, which uh, Alice is, of course. Uh, and uh, Alice has just always been quick-witted and up on the latest. Really whatever the Whatever the latest movie yeah. is or or song is he's always been the first to to tell everybody about it uh, tell me a little bit of this looks like an old sh i know it's not an mm -hmm. old shindig with jimmy o'neill no. those of you old enough to remember no. that they all had that kind of quaff you know but that's uh, you're on the extreme right correct yes and then the uh, vin slash alice and then yeah. your original drum uh, drummer what john, john spear, spear uh -huh. right. and then who's that glenn uh, on that's the left the guy the mc is uh uh, Pat McMahon, who yeah. did all then, kinds of different characters on the uh, Wallace and Ladmo cartoon show, okay. which ended up being <clears throat> the longest running local cartoon show in America. Wow. Okay. Uh, but we grew up on, on that show, uh, and then that was Glenn Buxton Glenn, beyond yeah. him. <clears throat> but that show had uh, great influence on us because. Uh, these guys, Pat McMahon, is basically three guys and then a guy who was a musician, but they would just make up these skits, a bunch of skits. So between cartoons, they'd do a skit and they would inevitably bomb. There would be like uh, Captain Super would be a, a superhero who couldn't do anything today because his cape was at the cleaners and and he'd jump off a ladder and land, and then the ladder would fall down in the background. So they had all these things. Uh, it's almost like you watch the show for what went wrong and how they would write it out. Uh, and then as we grew older, uh, the show started uh, appealing to the college uh, students and, and still bringing in the new kids. Sure. So they'd do these silly things that had double entendre meaning so so 
It reminds uh, me uh, also of, I don't know if you guys got it in Phoenix. There used to be a guy that was out of California, but they showed it here in, in New York uh, growing up where I did the uh, lower part of Connecticut, but uh, we got the New York signal. A guy named Lloyd Thaxton. I don't know if you oh, yeah, I remember. I remember Lloyd Thaxton. <laughs> Lloyd later became a producer. Yeah. He did a, uh, produced a, a guy named show, uh, David too. Horowitz, who was a consumer advocate. He, Lloyd actually mm -hmm. went behind the scenes many years later has passed unfortunately but a guy that just sounded like he had great stories but but uh that clip reminds me uh, reminds now, me now of that, that kind clip of the, the reason they were able to get a photograph of all of, of all of us standing that close together is because wayne newton was there oh my goodness and he told <laughs> us you know in his very high-pitched yeah. voice stand close together for television we're like okay wayne <laughs> No, it was, it's a good He was shot. very he young was really then, young. Oh, sure. before he, he went like to Vegas. barely 20, my goodness. Yeah, but you guys were Oh, no, he wasn't uh, even 20. Even that, no, yeah. he was a teenager. Was, uh, uh, he was riding high on Donka Shane uh, in those no, days. No, this was before this was that. Before. Oh, even before that. Yeah, uh, him and his brother were on the Lou King Ranger show, which was another local uh, television show, and it was the Newton brothers, Oh. him and his brother. And then, did not know and then that. he went off to Las Vegas sure. and... Uh, and yeah. made it oh, gigantic after that. Tremendous, tremendous. But he knew, stand close together. There you go. That's kind of how we operate here, folks. Sit, sit as close <laughs> together as you can. Dennis Dunaway, a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame member, Alice Cooper Group, along with uh, fashion designer and uh, bride, Cindy Smith Dunaway. Uh, the book Snakes, Guillotines, Electric Chairs, My Adventures in the Alice Cooper Group, along with Chris Hodenfield. Uh, Thomas Dunn Books uh, in cooperation with St. Martin's Press joining us here on Studio 411. Quote, I still consider Dennis Dunaway to be one of my best friends. Dennis is one of the few true sur surrealists that I've ever met. Say that three times. This book carries on in Dennis's own private surreal <laughs> surrealistic world. Uh, Vince, aka Alice Cooper. Yes. Yeah, so uh, high praise from your old your old school buddy. That's that's uh, pretty good. <laughs> nice to. Not, not often you see someone that goes back that far with someone. You know, people in life tend to kind of drift apart. Well, the original Alice were. Cooper group yeah. were all you know sure. went to school at high school at the same time in yeah. the same years. Um, we were and, like a family, really. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean Cindy uh, and Neil lived only a few you know, a couple of miles from where mm -hmm. my parents lived, and it was like that. But uh, Alice and I bonded our friendship in art class, and we liked the uh, surrealist artist and everything, and when we decided that we wanted to do a band, we decided we were going, I didn't want to give up art for music, I was an artist. Uh, so we decided, well, we'll incorporate art, artistic ideas into a rock band. So, but at that point, were you already playing the guitar? No, we started so, the band before. So you uh, actually took up the guitar and, and, and mastered it fairly quickly. That's amazing. Usually people uh, are starting at age seven, three, four years we old. We did 1964. It. We did a talent show at Cortez High School where we had one guy that played guitar and the rest of us pretended. And by 1965, we did a Halloween dance where we played the whole show. Wow. So one, one year, we, uh, I went away for the summer to Oregon, worked on my grandfather's farm to get the money to buy my first bass. And when I got back, we got busy and learned how to play. And uh, one thing, I won't give it away, but a lot of great stories, of, again, about you know, cars being sold for, for God knows, instruments, food, room and board, whatever. The story you just told about, you know, uh, 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 having to part with something in order to get something. Again, these was serious business. I think you guys had a vision from the get-go of what you wanted to do and how you were, maybe didn't know the road you were going to take, but that, you know, it was really between the two of you. I really, and Glenn probably we did. was. Actually, actually, we talked, uh, Alice and I talked the other guys into being as enthusiastic and driven toward this artistic vision, whatever it was, uh, uh, with us. And, uh, you know, Neil was in a rival band. That's the first time I met Cindy, I was in an audience, and and maybe you should tell this story. Yeah, I heard I heard he uh, he didn't exactly endear himself to you. Well, no, <laughs> even though you didn't know a, who it he was. It was a local <laughs> battle, battle of the bands in Phoenix, and everybody. The deal was is that everybody was going to use the same drum, uh, the same 
drums the and same so on. equipment right. equipment yeah. so that they didn't have to interchange it wouldn't take as long and Dennis was standing in front of me I think and saying talking to someone else because Neil being Neil had a drum riser and and wanted his drums to play so Neil had them move all the equipment Ooh. so he could set yeah. up a big drum riser <laughs> and I'm ranking on him totally ranking on him and I just I just told him to shut up that um, he was my brother and he was the best drummer in the world there you go so that was those are our first words to each other there you go and wow <laughs> I'll tell you smooth moves it's on the, the part <laughs> of Dr. Dreary there it's not yeah and you know the next couple times weren't, yeah, weren't it was, much it's smoother. actually we laugh because the the whole series of we have a whole series of events that it's pretty funny oh yeah as we, I read through the book I mean I I I, believe me, I think I think uh, a guy on The Bachelor would have had a better chance than you. I just like saw him, and it just he's just not making the right moves, you know. Well, and it's, then, not, uh, it's not the last time she told me to <laughs> shut up. Yes, no. yeah, no, I know. <laughs> no. Yeah, oh, br brother, we can relate. We can relate. Trust me. Uh, question: If they made a movie about you, who would play you? If they ever decide, let's make a movie about this book, who would play Dennis Dunaway? Wow. They, yeah. they had a very young guy play me in this uh, vinyl, vinyl t television series, this guy, Ben Resendez. Okay. Um, and I could see a resemblance when I looked at his picture uh, of me when I was very young, maybe even as young as that picture we showed a moment ago. Uh, you know, of course, they put the wig, so he had the hair down to the waist and all of that, and he had to pretend that he, he had to learn my stage sure. moves mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, but who would I pick if I if I was in charge of that? That's I don't know, maybe you one. would be better. No, I, that's and a I'll tough she'll one. say Johnny Depp and for I'll anybody, oh, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Johnny <laughs> can be anybody, he's he amazing. He can be, he's and like I think chameleon. that's really, yeah. that's a perfect choice. And actually. now let me ask you, either one of you yeah, jump okay, in, we'll but I'll, I'll, Depp. I'll who, who would play <laughs> Cindy Smith? Oh, wow. Mm. I, I have a thought, but again, not actually, now. maybe one of our daughters. I would Heidi say, Klum. Heidi. Wow, yeah. that would be good. That, if the, like if the movie Klum. was done like 30 years ago, I would say Terry Gar could play Cindy oh, Smith. Yeah, oh, that would yeah, be yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, that that would yeah. work for me. Yeah. But actually, like I said, one of our daughters could because they, they're go. both. They both mimic me um, for the fun of it, actually. Yeah. <laughs> just as, you know, a parent thing. Well, they've got her humor down. Yeah. But their go. humor is like double humor because oh. it's sarcastically imitating their mother. <laughs> or me. Or, yeah. Yeah, it's interchangeable. They're both very good at, at go. pretending Video they're us. And, and yeah, every, every little tiny thing that we don't realize we actually do. I wanted to mention too, in addition to the uh, the book, which uh, already is in multiple uh, printings, uh, uh, we have the uh, the audio book. And give me the website uh, on the audio. Audible.com. Audible.com. That uh, just go. came uh, uh, is out as well, and uh, oh, nearly eleven hours uh, of uh, Dennis, right? Or anyone yeah. else is uh, no? There's no no, it's, no it's sound me. effects, no rattling chains, no, no. nothing. No. Nope, it's all Cindy just doesn't me make a cameo in that. No, she could do that part about don't yell at my brother. You know, this yeah, is actually, <laughs> I, I wish. Uh, there you go. No, it's all me. And uh, you read uh, right through it. It which came is out. Crazy. Uh, it it's only been out about a week, and already uh, it's doing quite well. You can find all that stuff easily on DennisDunaway.com. Absolutely. And just go to books. Go to Amazon. Go to Audible. And and you'll find it there. There you go. Uh, we and have all Dunway. kinds of pictures com. on the website, the uh, costumes that Cindy's made over the years, and uh, everything that we're up to is on there. There you go. Here's a shot, uh, grainy back in the day, mm -hmm. of you and uh, Glenn, Glenn Buxton, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, there you go. That was after probably a, uh, an all-nighter. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was uh, yeah, probably. Uh, we had, uh, uh, Alice and I decided we were going to start a band, but we had no idea what we were. He didn't know he was, would be the singer, and I didn't know I would be the bass player, but we knew that we needed a guitar, somebody that could play. So Glenn was this guy that just moved to Phoenix, and, and he was, looked like kind of a tough guy to us, as we were the, the nerds, you know. And we approached him, and he said, sure, he'll give it a shot, you know. And so... 
uh, but we started hearing all these stories back in Akron, you know, and these crazy characters like uh, Gibby Hornets and uh, what, what was the girl's name, Dickie? The... Oh, my best friend when I was little, Winky Dicky. Winky yeah. Dicky. So <laughs> names like that, and and Glenn would be, we we couldn't believe him. They were sounded like he was making all this stuff up. And then when we got in 1967, this was in, uh, we started in 1964. And then in 1967, when we got Neil into the band, who was also from Akron, all of a sudden we're hearing these same <laughs> stories in stereo. They both knew Bookdale High School and all of this stuff. And I was like, oh my God, it's true. <laughs> well, you knew it was a match, a match made in, in heaven for yeah. a group, for sure. But uh, Glenn Buxton was definitely a one-of-a-kind character with a golden heart, mm -hmm. even though life was tough for him. But... Uh, the best way to describe him, I think, people say he was our Keith Richards, but uh, he had more of like a W.C. Fields kind of uh, mm -hmm. this sarcastic viewpoint of, a, of the world where he didn't like rules uh, and he made fun of things like uh, he wouldn't give somebody a, a, a gift on their birthday because society says you're supposed right. to do expected, that. It's expected, yeah. So he would give people a gift just out of the blue. You know, and so a nonconformist with that, with that. Uh... Well, he just didn't like any kind of authority or anybody <laughs> telling him how yeah. he should do things. So, uh, but, but and sweet, he all, such a sweet guy, a sweet guy. But he had this uh, sar his sarcasm could just whittle you down. <laughs> I mean, it was it was pretty brutal, but yeah, in yeah. a funny it was way. Great. He would he we would walk into a restaurant. And uh, the Alice Cooper group dressed the way we did, even like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And we'd walk into the restaurant, and everything would get quiet. And Glenn would say, "I guess we walked into the no speaking zone." And it'd be something like you'd think, well, "I can't believe he said that." But then people that you wouldn't think would laugh would laugh because he would say what people were thinking and wish that they could say, but. He'd be great in politics nowadays, wouldn't he? <laughs> oh, boy. Yikes. Fit oh, right boy. in with, uh, with uh, yeah. some people. Yeah, <laughs> we'll talk about nameless. throwing all the rules out the window. <laughs> and uh, just uh, uh, to point of reference, Glenn is on the extreme right on that photo, correct? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Now, no. I wanted to jump ahead this. I love these posters from, you mm -hmm. know, and this one you guys were in. I mean, without naming all the names, look at some of the people, some of whom are still touring in some way, shape, or form. Chicago. Uh, some members of the Birds, uh, uh, the Guess Who, the Zombies, who are terrific, had a chance to uh, sit and talk with them uh, uh, after a show about some stuff. Taj Mahal, Little Richard, Poco, your buddies, the Chamber, Chambers Brothers, which, yeah. you know, time has come today. That is just, that is They're just from one. They're Connecticut. They are. I mm -hmm. was not aware of that. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. one when it's on the radio, you just want to crank that yep. up and let me oh, tell you, yeah. nothing, and the, nothing one better. one of the uh, early more cowbell yeah. songs. Yes, there you go. <laughs> Alice Cooper, The Grassroots, um, uh, just, you know, phenomenal. And probably for less Love. than $10. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Well, that's the other thing too that, you know, kind of touch on this a little bit without, you know, divulging, you know, uh, every, every nickel and dime. But I mean, people think that in these days that, well, it was like, oh, they must be making millions and billions. I mean, you know, the ticket prices were what three dollars, five dollars, ten dollars. I can remember. Uh, yeah, and a Eagles. lot of times uh, when we were taking that whole big giant stage on the on the road, mm -hmm. uh, the ticket prices would be three fifty, and then it got up to six dollars, and people were uh, complaining. And then I think six uh, six fifty, maybe eight fifty, was the yeah. really high. And there'd be really good opening bands oh, too. Sure. You know, flown I, mean, I remember even amazing. in 76 to see the Eagles, which was, you know, back at the uh, 77, winter of 77. It was like, I think, 1650 to see the Eagles. You know, now you, you need to take a second mortgage, although mm -hmm. now, you know, with uh, Glenn Fry passing in 2016, that might be a little more difficult. But but my point is, you know, it hadn't elevated it's that insane. much even in the 10 years from when you guys started. Mm -hmm. And initially right. you were working for basically you know, here's a meal, you know, get up and play some more. You know? So it was like, uh, mm -hmm. how did we do that? I mean, we had, uh, we had our road crew, we had, uh, you know, a road manager, and we had a lighting person who did this amazing dramatic lighting, which made us different than anybody else. 
but basically it was kind of like circus sort of uh, mentality where everybody was mul did multiple sure. jobs and everybody was busy all the time to, to take this big show yeah. with props and theatrical, you know, ideas Everybody and all the of the lighting. House. You know, most bands didn't even, they would just show up and use whatever lighting was yeah. available, except maybe the Grateful Dead would have, you know, headlights would tour with them. Right. But we had our own lighting that we took with us, you know, tie it on the top of a station wagon and, and we did it like that. And then we ha also were lucky enough <laughs> <laughs> to have this uh, beautiful costume designer there that. You go. <laughs> but everybody lived. I mean, there were band houses in those days, and there aren't now. You know, I mean, it was it was very typical for Jefferson Airplane had their own band house in San oh, Francisco. Oh, in San Francisco, sure. The Grateful Dead. Every that's just that's Quick was the way of life. Messenger service. Right, that all was the way of life. House. Everybody was there for a purpose and worked as a family unit. Now that doesn't happen no, anymore. It's a, there, there's too much. <clears throat> too much sudden money involved and whatever and whether whether they're still getting swindled or maybe not getting what they deserve the point is it's it's to another level mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. well times have changed i mean e now if the alice cooper group lived in the same house we'd probably still be mostly communicating by phone or right, texting right, yeah <laughs> <clears throat> yeah for sure Cindy Smith Dunaway that's like a tongue you twister can't. i don't know Cindy Smith Dunaway <laughs> say that 5 times and Dennis Dunaway joining us here for the hour on Studio 411. Snakes, guillotines, electric chairs, my adventures in the Alice Cooper group. So uh, uh, terrific, terrific book. And uh, uh, speaking of which, I'll read it off of here. I was going to bring it up later. Uh, for a fan of the Alice Cooper band, as I have been since my adolescence in the 1970s, Cooper bassist Dennis Dunaway's firsthand account of the group's humble beginnings heady triumphs and arguably inevitable implosion is gripping stuff. The Michael J. Fox, who is a Cooper holic, I guess, right? So uh, the artist who did uh, the cover of Alice Cooper's greatest hits album, where we're gangsters yes. out in front of a garage, and uh, this guy, uh, Drew Struzan, went on to do the Raiders of the Lost Ark posters wow. and all Spielberg and, and uh, Lucas uh, films, so most of the posters, and has gone on to become the most collectible poster artist in the world. Well, they made uh, a documentary, documentary about him called Drew Struess and the Man Behind the Poster. And they, I get a call and like they're like, well, we want you to be in this... Uh, documentary. Uh, uh, we've got Spielberg, we've got Harrison <laughs> Ford, we've got George Lucas, we've got Michael wow. J. Fox. And like, company, I'm yeah. like, wait so a minute. let's get Dennis. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> How did I get on this list of names? They said, well, because as far as all of our research, you seem to be the only person that we've ever heard of that actually watched Drew draw. And I said, wow. I did. I did. I was standing over his shoulder and watched him create uh, this poster. And see, in shoebox number 107, I actually made a notation that I, that I saw him draw, right? <laughs> There's probably a record of it somewhere. Uh, I, I don't know how they found that information <laughs> that out. That is crazy but, that they did that. But anyway, so now I go into New York City and, and there are film crews there and everything. And they're like, oh man, Michael J. Fox was just here. And when he heard that you were coming, he went on for like a half hour about how big of a fan he is of the Alice Cooper group. I'm like, really? I never knew that. So now moving forward to 2011, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction at the Waldorf Astoria in New York City, uh, Michael was sitting at the table next to ours. So Cindy and I went over and said hi. And I said, I heard you're a big Alice Cooper fan. He said, you want to know how big a fan I am? I know all the guitar parts from wow. the Pretties for You That's album, great. which is avant-garde stuff. I said, we don't even know those parts. Uh, he said, That's why I'm here to see you guys get inducted. So there you go. So, Interesting color on this. Uh, <laughs> I know, also, yeah. That's also, not when I was, that. color. That's also, when I was asking people, if they would be interested in doing a promotional quote for the book, he, he got right back to me. I mean, it was almost immediate. <laughs> and uh, pretties for you, and to see, uh, ask and it'll, re it'll appear. Now here's, can we get a shot of the band? This is what, circa 19? 
1968. 68. Okay. That's when yeah. that picture was taken. The album came out in 69, but we yeah. recorded it in 68. That's amazing. Amazing. And as I pull back, he said, and we have, uh, let's see, we have, uh, don't tell me, Neil, left to right, Neil, Glenn, Alice, and Blonde or something. I don't know what that was going on there. Uh, I'll uh, tell you, you why when you get Looking dapper as ever. And then this is Michael on the end. Did I That's get it right? That's correct. And why was Alice blonde? Because at the time, uh, Tiny Tim was big. Ah. And when we would walk down Hollywood Boulevard, <laughs> everybody would say Tiny Tim. So uh, he did his hair blonde to get away from that. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. But Cindy made a lot of those costumes, and that, that was early on for that uh, glittery And now uh, you're, work. real uh, quick, your, your background as far as schooling or... Um, I've basically been sewing since I was 10 mm -hmm. and I, you know, I was in 4-H growing up and my aunt was like an amazing seamstress and I lived with her on the farm in the summer and so that's how I learned and it was just a natural thing for me. It's, it's how I expressed myself. We didn't have a lot of money for clothes, I had a lot of hand-me-downs so I got to make them, you know, and that was, it was just kind of a freedom. And what about now the concepts? I mean, obviously oh, you the sound concepts? like a very, a very imaginative person. I mean, well, did we, it just we, come we to you a, or, you know? Well, yeah, but we also had, each, each album had a topic to it pretty gotcha, much, so okay. a theme. So we just worked off of that and I would work with each guy and you know, go over designs with them and change certain things, and and um, it was it was just it was a whole unit that it was like putting together a play. Sure. Kind of. The I light lighting person would be there, and Cindy would be there with her sketch pad, and like uh, we uh, like to think that we were reflecting society. So when the band lived in Hollywood, of course, it's going to be glitzy. So uh, then. Uh, Cindy came up with uh, designs that uh, supported that. And then that became so popular, uh, we kind of uh, kept that uh, glittery look going for a long time. And this here, we'll get a shot of this in a second. It's actually double-sided, so it's almost like kind of a mural effect, but this is the uh, Alice Cooper uh, in wonderful, glorious vinyl, folks. Uh, see, you're, you're in a room of folks here that love vinyl, so, you know. So deal with it. <laughs> and if, hey, people uh, love vinyl again. Oh, absolutely. And if you yeah. look very close at the hubcaps on that car, they say Drew. Oh, there you go. The artist yeah, put Snucky's name yeah. in there. <laughs> and also here on the, uh, the little montage, we have Alice's reaction in recent vintage uh, when the book came out. And Dennis, I guess, is either trying to explain to him exactly Yes, did this it did happen as we we wrote it, or perhaps who were you talking about? I'm not I'm not quite sure what uh, the reaction. We were, we were, were just, just being hams. symbolically, yeah, being ham, mm -hmm. symbolically expressing our differences of uh, <laughs> memories. Snakes, guillotines, electric chairs. My adventures in the Alice Cooper group. Dennis Dunaway, along with Cindy Smith Dunaway, joining us for the hour here on Studio 411. And I have to tell the story because otherwise I, I didn't leave the show off with it because I don't know why. I was just awed by the scenery we have here today. <laughs> uh, 19, I want to say 79. If not, it was, yeah, it was 79. I was um, at the time uh, down near the University of Bridgeport above the bookstore. I don't remember Cindy being there. I remember you. I was there with uh, several people at a, at a club that was above the bookstore, right, right, where the, right on the cusp of where the campus ended. And there was a club there, and who's playing there but Billion Dollar Babies. And a friend of mine who at the time worked for the then uh, Bridgeport Post-Telegram, now known as the Connecticut Post, uh, had said, hey, let's go see these guys. You know, they're, they're you know, uh, formerly Alice Cooper, you know, this, that, and that. I'm like, yeah, what are you kidding me? This is like a dive bar, you know, uh, on top of this bookstore, you know, and I'm like, you're kidding me, they're, they're not going to be there. I mean, you know, I thought the place was was going to be terrible, but it turned out it was a great place. You guys, obviously, the, the outfits you must have made, I remember they were white, I remember, or kind of a glittery, you know, kind of maybe with some trim, gold mm -hmm. trim or silver trim. Um, your brother, who for years I mistakenly thought was Dennis, I mean, he was just, you know, looked like, like a Laker, you know, Laker ball player. Yeah. And then on top of it, you guys had the platform shoes. 
<laughs> you never had those. Well, no, Neil, uh, you're, I'm, I'm I trying to put this together. Did. I don't and know what that. Oh, Neil definitely oh, did. Oh, yeah. And he was 6'3". No, and then when you guys took a break so. between sets, because my friend was working for the newspaper, he says, yeah, come on, I'll introduce you. And we're like, you know, you've got to be kidding me. And I'm like, I know, what are we going to say to these guys? And we're like in awe. And you guys couldn't have been any nicer. And, and then when, when you know, we, we were able to hook up and get you on, then I had this flashback. And, oh, my God. I wow. said, you know, I 30 you know 30 some years ago and and actually you know had an encounter with you guys and i'm thinking there's the outfits there's the whole thing guys sounded great and i'm thinking you're playing in a room that's probably no bigger than this studio well that's the great thing about entertainment and you know traveling musicians or like you having guests come you know it, it does seem to you keep running into sure. people and, and meeting <clears throat> lots of people and next thing you know you feel like you're friends even though you've met them yeah. you know uh, a few times over your career sure. and uh, uh, that's what we love about it Cindy and I are very creative people and uh, our daughters are creative and we have uh, uh, we're luckily uh, surrounded by lots of creative friends and a lot of lots of kindred spirits which uh, keeps us uh, going. Let me just throw this real, just quick two second answers here from, uh, we'll start with Dennis. Uh, uh, best singer ever? That you've either worked with or that you've admired? Uh, Aretha Franklin. Okay, guitarist. Wow. One name. I like Glenn Buxton. Okay, <laughs> drummer. Well, if I said Glenn, I gotta say Neil. <laughs> yeah, and, and you that's do, yeah. Keyboardist. Yeah. Hmm? Keyboardist or piano. Oh, wow. uh, uh, Elton John. Elton John, okay, who actually uh, in, in the book, uh, the, he, you had a, an encounter with him mm -hmm. back in the day. He probably yeah, he was, was at the Hollywood yeah. Bowl. Oh, yeah, he was probably just what? It was probably Honky Chateau era, Don't Shoot Me, I'm Only the Piano. It was somewhere in that era. Yeah, yeah that right. was amazing. Now, Cindy, again, uh, obviously, oh, uh, best oh, singer ever. God. That oh, you God. just knocks your socks off. I have to say, oh, any genre. There's so many. There's so many. But does Johnny Depp sing? No, <laughs> stop. No. He might um, have been the Lone Ranger, but I'm I don't gonna say know. Otis Redding. <laughs> Otis Redding, very oh, good. Oh yeah. Guitarist. Stevie Ray Vaughan and GB. Okay. Yeah. Drummer. My brother Ex Neil. Okay, if, if a second a runner-up, who would that be? A second runner-up oh, for drummer. Um, I'm going to say Jim McCarty of the Yardbirds. Okay, very He's good. He's a really yeah. good and super uh, good piano drummer. keyboardist. Um, I'm going to go with Elton John. Do I have okay. to pick somebody no, else? No, that's no? fine. No, okay. that's good. That's Elton a high John. high praise. Believe me, that's high praise from uh, from Elton or for Elton, I should say. Elton was at the uh, induction ceremony uh, at the Waldorf. He uh, uh, came to the rehearsal, and he walked out. And this is how the day started. This is like amazing. eleven o'clock in the morning, we find ourselves all on stage uh, with Bette Midler and. Uh, uh, Elton John and the Darlene CBS Love. Orchestra, Darlene Love, Dr. John, all these people. And Elton comes out and says hi to everybody. And then he sits down and he has his legal pad and he starts everything that uh, Paul Schaefer said about the arrangement of the song and everything, Elton wrote it down. Very serious. And then he played it perfect. But uh, that's the kind of guy he is, a perfectionist. That's the mark of a good that musician. Go, he could, I mean, it's the do ron ron. He can yeah. play it in his sleep, I'm sure. But it was amazing. No, he wanted to yeah. make sure everything was perfect. That's why I love to, uh, not again, at this point in your career, it's not going to be on the same level as a goodbye yellow brick road, but I loved when he and one of his mentors, unbeknownst maybe to Leon, but when he did that album a few years ago with Leon Russell, mm -hmm. I mean, again, those, I've seen Leon perform, and boy, I tell you, you can't get much better than those two, but Billy Joel and Elton maybe, but I mean, in you terms know, of also singer, it's, songwriters. It's, uh, sad and timely, uh, Keith Emerson. Yeah. Uh, I just saw him like three years ago at this chiller theater expo in New Jersey, Parsippany. They have these big monster conventions at the Sheridan there. And uh, Keith Emerson, uh, I met him for the first time where I actually got had a chance to hang out with him and talk to him a lot. And he has this great, goofy sense of humor. But uh, he sat in with the band uh, on uh, at a party there. 
and I was standing right behind him. There was a pillar on stage, and I'm standing, I could have put my hand out and put it on his shoulder, and I watched him play, and I thought, this is, guy is as amazing as ever. And, uh, and then afterwards, he was apologizing that he didn't think he played very good. I'm like, what? I was standing right there. It was a... It, it leads me to believe of all the uh, musical instruments, keyboardists must be ultra perfectionists, because it's funny how we just, amongst the names we just tossed out, that they're all very, you know, want to be meticulous or making notes. As you said, you would think they'd know the song backwards. A lot of them, I think uh, it's because, you know, you, your uh, lifestyle, a lot of it is formed when you're young. And a lot of keyboardists, you know, took lessons mm -hmm. when they were very sure. young. And, you know, and then they were the kid that was, you know, in practicing while the other kids were out playing tag football or whatever. Like Lady Gaga. She's amazing. Sure. I mean, she's such an amazing player. You know, when she, once performer. people got past the theatrics, you know, right. really at the heart of it. I well, mean, we, ha she we is... can relate right. to that. <laughs> <laughs> we'd, we'd work very hard writing this song, Is It My Body?, and thinking we want a bump and grind song because Neil had this, uh, gotten this snake that somebody threw on stage in Florida, and Neil decided that uh, we could use the snake in the in the show. So we decided we need a song for that. So we worked very hard coming up with this song, and we couldn't wait to play it and impress everybody with it. And and then uh, we did the show and read about the snake. There she is. There you go. There's the snake. Uh, the snake had a name. What was the Kachina. snake? Kachina. Yeah. <laughs> so now, not not the same snake that Alice held up at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. No, that, no, that, no, that looked no. substantially larger and <laughs> yellow. Yeah, and that yellow. Was, yeah. Yes, yeah, that was an albino uh, python. Here's, here's one, just so that uh, uh, we were talking earlier about the, uh, the, the, the now that's, coloration uh, yeah. or lack thereof. This is the original schools out uh, mm -hmm. LP, and that's mm -hmm. the original one with the original dust cover on there the record. Go. There you go. That's well, super. I'm telling you. Snakes, guillotines, electric chairs. My adventures in the Alice Cooper band. Uh, now also out on uh, audiobook. Uh, for more information, audible.com, correct? And, yes. And of course, the, uh, the hardcover for us purists, uh, Thomas Dunn Books in association with St. Martin's Press, Snakes, Guillotines, Electric Chairs. And uh, let's see, your old producer, there may be many versions of this story, but Dennis's is one of the most colorful, insightful, and entertaining. And that's from Bob Ezrin, who was your uh, record producer back in the day. And, uh, yes. and uh, you Still hooked, uh, hooked up with him uh, a few years ago to record some tunes. Um, we're winding down here. We've got a few minutes left. I want to throw it to Cindy. Just tell us a little bit about, and we'll have the camera pick it up behind you, the, the uh, couple of the costumes you were uh, kind enough to bring uh, to the show. Um, this one is actually in one of the posters that you had on your um, Montage, display yeah, here. Yeah. Um, and it's that's actually my favorite poster of the band, but um, it was from a German radio show, or TV show. But this jacket I made out of um, an old, uh, a vintage Mexican festival skirt. And I was like I was saying earlier that the it's so worn that the the sequins are made out of like celluloid and they actually have some of them have melted, so they're complete. But this is one of my favorite pieces. Um, and then green pants to go with it. So this was from the Love It to Death. No, I I'm sorry. This was from tour. the Killer tour, and this one was from Schools Out. And I did like fun jumpsuits for all the guys, and um, every single rhinestone that was that's on here i put on by hand wow. i did like all of the rhinestones um were all i didn't have a bedazzler or anything. yeah not all like were now yeah hand punched by wow. hand you know so um, cindy would uh, would make sketches and everything and then everybody would ha she'd have everybody's measurements and all of that and then it seemed like overnight the next morning she'd come out with all of this amazing stuff Absolutely. Well, these Which, took a little more, and and the fabric was really hard to find at the time. There was only one place in the city I could find it. And we're thankful again that you brought this because again, in so many of the photos, as you well know, that because black and white was still pervasive in those days. I mean, we had that earlier shot with the band mm -hmm. kind of taken from a lower angle up. That was one of the ones where you really can appreciate, you know, the work that went into it. But a lot of times with the black and white photos. 
uh, whether it's an album cover or right. just you Can't know uh, old old footage it's hard to uh, fully appreciate and the, the work that again people look at it like oh yeah it's everything is instantaneous and get my bedazzler out and just you know two minutes oh yeah glenn your outfit's ready you know it doesn't didn't work like that i'm sure no no and cindy had to have the finest she couldn't just go with any old rhinestones she had to have the i did Savorsky crystals before they were even the austrian crystals even before they were popular wow. you know um, i would go into the city and buy them by the gross cut glass wasn't sparkly nope. enough for her <laughs> <laughs> no nope. um I wanted to mention too now, I, I mentioned the Who, correct me if I was uh, misspoke, but you've designed costumes for other bands. I didn't correct? design the, they, they came in where I actually met Joe and Shep, mm -hmm. the managers. Um, they used to shop in the store where, where I designed clothing and um, Pink Floyd were friends of ours and they also shopped in the store. And great story so. in the book, uh, which we don't have time to talk about, but it's Sid Barrett again, you know, who a lot of people, you know, true Pink Floyd or what would they call him? What, 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 like uh, pinkies or floydies or whatever? Well, I'm never, you're making stuff up now. No, no, I that, no, there's, no, I'm sure there's like, you know, like Zeppelin fans or whatever, yeah, you know, know. Pink, pinks, I don't know. I, you know that's, that's another pinks, thing. Pinks, yeah. that sounds like yeah, a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, but the, it goes way back to the beginning. And of course he had, you know, some uh, health issues, et cetera, et cetera. But just, yeah, there you go. But you guys, yeah. it's like a who's who of like encounters. I mean, there was a thing in one of the, uh, the earlier chapters, of course, love Eric Burden and the animals, you know, yeah. you get advice from Eric Burden, which correct me if I'm wrong, was about, you know, money issues and making sure you get things signed or whatever. So Eric, you know, very savvy. Yeah. He's almost like a Chuck Berry. I, I've seen him a few times over the years. Believe me, the check better be in, in now his wife is, Mm -hmm. third or fourth wife whatever <laughs> basically the check is in the in the palm before he even goes on stage so it really is like a chuck berry deal going on yeah. but very savvy and that's you know because again the guys and gals would be constantly getting you know um What's the word Eric gave me another bit of uh, advice. Ripped once, off. Is the uh, word you're ripped off. For. Yes, I was yeah. going to use something yeah. a little. Stronger, we didn't listen but. to him, and I'm not sure that the animals all came out that <laughs> no, no, great. No, no, no. Either I, but, Eric did. I, I'm not sure about the uh, the others. Yeah. Uh, but I was in line for the men's room at the Whiskey A Go Go back in the '60s, and Eric was in front of me, and he was kind of propping himself up, and he said, "No matter how drunk you are tonight." You're sober in the morning. There you go. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's. I love it. I love it. Brilliant. Well, I tell you, we <laughs> we could we could go on for hours. And by the way, just so we know, Cindy did not design that planter that is next to her. So yeah, no, she not, she she's, she's she's. I think it's she's going to take it home with her. But she she really uh, really likes security. Uh, uh, what is that? The, the A poinsettia? Christmas poinsettia. poinsettia. Yes, yes, yeah. So poinsettia. they're kind of all year round now. I think. <laughs> They yes. are. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm not a huge fan, but we'll leave it at that. Uh, Snakes, I am a fan of this book. I got to tell you, a marvelous book, uh, uh, just uh, uh, a joy for me to uh, have you guys on the show. And speaking of one last comment, Neil Smith, songwriter, drummer, and founding member of Alice Cooper, a refreshingly unique perspective telling the band's amazing story, a must read for every Alice Cooper fan. And uh, you can't get any higher praise than a brother-in-law, can you? you <laughs> That's go. right. That's right. There you go. Uh, very, Neil's very not good. easy to get a compliment out of either. <laughs> no, I know. I know. And like I said, I, I'm still in awe from back in 79, seeing him at that club. And I'm like, look at the, this guy is huge. I mean, like, I, you know, it's like, and he's the drummer. <laughs> And, like, and he's bigger than life. So put him in a, in a smaller room. He needs Madison Square Garden to really, you yeah. know, do his thing. There you go. All right, the book, Snakes, Guillotines, Electric Chairs, My Adventures in the Alice Cooper Group. Uh, there, there's a shot of Dennis. Dennis, wall to wall. That, that's, in, I think, in his living room. That's not even a bookstore. <laughs> you see that? That's, he's, he's ready to go at any moment to, uh, to go and, and, uh, and talk to people about the book, I got to tell you. And even that shirt Cindy designed for that, me. There you go. Those are runes. The book, Thomas Dunn Books, in cooperation with St. Martin's Press, uh, DennisDunaway.com. Uh, again, I can't thank you enough. The guitar here, we'll get a shot of that. Again, just, you know, not the original, but a reasonable facsimile. So, uh, look at that. That's uh, How do you refer to that? That's your... The billion dollar the base. The billion dollar base. Made there by the Fender Custom Shop. There you go. All right. Well, 
We've come to another uh, episode, the end rather, of Studio 411. Larry De Silva, thanking you for joining us, as well as thanking Cindy Smith Dunaway, fashion designer uh, for the band, of course, the Alice Cooper Group, and Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. That sounds sweet. That's like a ball player saying, you know what? It's nice to be called a Hall of Famer, and I'm sure Rock and Roll Hall of Famer is even better than that. So my, my uh, humble thanks to you both for making time to come and join us. Thank you for And from us. Uh, the uh, recent collaboration with the uh, Bouchard brothers, Joe and Albert Bouchard, uh, their band Blue Coop that Dennis is now a member of, founding member of this as well. And we're going to hear a track called uh, Train for Thought. And uh, that'll take us out. So thanks for watching us here on Studio 411. We will see you next time. Take care. Blue steam across the track. It was the strangest thing. This girl had ever bought a one-way ticket on the train of thought. We all started rolling. Wasted on this train